trash coming out, but I know that I actually would have liked to see this. This is what I want my network to spit out. I want all these numbers to be zero, and I want this number to be really high, because then I have a good classifier. And so the only thing that machine learning is going to do is it's going to look at this thing, which is coming out of my network, complete trash, and it's going to compare it with what I really want to see. And then it's just going to say, OK, this number was pretty low, so that's kind of fine. Here I had a high number, it's kind of fine. But this number was really high, and in fact, it should have been zero. So there I have a really high cost. And for every single one of those numbers here, I'm going to compute a cost function. And I'm going to say, what is the cost of this three? Well, I have this kind of number here that says how wrong my classifier was. So I want to get this number to zero, because if I get this to zero, then I actually get this as an output. And this is basically what the backpropagation algorithm does. That's, that's what this guy, Jeffrey Hinton, invented uh, in 1986, is this algorithm that says, well, what would happen if I take this number right here, so this part of the matrix, and if I increase that value? Would that make my output better, or would it make it worse? And you're basically going to do that for every single number in your uh, network, and you're going to see if I change it, if I increase it or decrease it, will my classifier get better or will it get worse? And so it turns out that if you do this for 100 images, nothing happens. Your network still sucks. But if you do this for 5 million images, then your network actually gets better. And if you keep doing this for long enough on a really big data set, then it turns out that all these weights here, all these numbers, they start configuring themselves in such a way that if you give it a new image that it's never seen before, that it can actually correctly predict what number that is. And so that's basically what machine learning is doing. You start with random numbers, but you have a data set of examples, and you start changing your network step by step until finally it does what you want it to do. So I hope everybody sort of got the, the general feel of it. Of course, I've skipped a lot of technical details, but I think in terms of really understanding it for business applications, this is what you need to understand. That's kind of basically what is going on under the hood. And so if we look at what we have right now, we have this deep neural network, and it turns out that if we combine it with a lot of training data, and we use this magical hat, which is the backpropagation algorithm, then out comes a program. And what is the program doing? Well, it's looking at images, and it's doing steps of computation, and at the output, I have an answer. So I always think of neural networks, I mean, imagine you have a deep neural net that has 50 layers, then I like to think of this as a parallel computer that gets 50 time steps of computation to produce an output. That's what a neural network is doing. It takes all of these inputs, it does a few time steps of computation, and then it gives you an answer. So that's why I call it programs, because basically they turn data into programs. That's what these neural networks do. Okay. Um, now I have a few slides on, okay, it's kind of logical what this thing is doing, but after it's trained, it's kind of interesting to actually know what is happening in the middle here. And so I have a few funny examples, um, which is, for example, here, what you can do if you have a, a trained neural network, what you can actually start doing is you can take one of these neurons here, and you can go through your entire training data, and you can feed it all the images that it has seen, and see, for example, when does this neuron spike? When does this one give a high value? And then you can start seeing that some of these neurons actually learn interpretable things. So for example, this one here, it always fires whenever there are fringes, for example, in the input image. Whenever there's these fringes, it fires. The second neuron here apparently learned how to recognize dog faces or cat faces. So whenever a dog or a cat face is present in the input image, then one of these neurons is going to say, hey guys, I saw a cat or a dog. Right? And there are other things that apparently, you know, they respond to clouds or fluffy things, and there are even uh, neurons that respond to, you know, a building with a blue background behind. Right? So it turns out that when we train these systems using just the approach that I just showed you, there's this approach, it turns out that these neurons in the middle, they start learning things that are kind of interpretable, and that's nice. Right? And you have these really funny examples where people sort of looked at what neurons were doing, and apparently one of these neurons is recognizing a specific pattern, but it's not really clear what it's looking for, but you can still see the pattern that it tries to detect, right? You have the same over here, you have a few other very funny examples where it's really obvious what the neuron is learning, but it's kind of funny if you look at the data examples that it's actually firing on, right? Um, and so the intuition that we have right now is what these networks are doing is they're learning very simple things in the beginning of the network. So things like edges and lines and dots. And then what they're doing is as you go through the network, they are combining these very simple things into more complicated stuff. So for example, you could detect lines and edges, you could create more complicated objects, and then at the end of your network, you can, for example, start detecting faces, right? So they're doing hierarchical uh, composition. 
This is an example for a self-driving car. For example, it needs to detect different cars on the road. So the first layers, they try to learn very simple detectors, like, for example, going from a dark region in the image to a very bright region. Then the layers on top will combine these simple features into like parts of a, a car door, parts of a wheel, and then at the end of the network, you have neurons that fire for specific types of cars, for example, an Audi A7, right? Uh, and it turns out there's been a lot of neuroscience research that actually backs up this intuition. So there were a bunch of researchers that actually implemented electrodes in a person's uh, visual cortex, and it turns out that every single one of us has a specific neuron that only fires when we see the face of Jennifer Aniston. So they actually attached this neuron, and they looked at when does it fire, and they showed this person a whole bunch of images, and this neuron only fires when you see Jennifer Aniston's face, right? It's kind of strange to know, but we all have one, apparently. All right, um, so neural networks are kind of doing hierarchical feature composition and you can do really fancy stuff with them. But what I also like to show is that there are still a lot of cases where machine learning doesn't really work as well as we would like it to. So they've been saying that you know, machine learning and AI is going to be the next big thing and it's going to be sentient in the next 10 years, it will put all of the humans out of a job and it's really foolproof. But the thing is they've been saying this for a really long time. Right? Uh, you know, machine learning has been around for 60 years now, and they've been saying that it would be you know, sentient uh, for the next year. You know, they've been saying this ever since the beginning, and we also have had a few winters where people suddenly realized, okay, AI's got its limits, we probably hit some limits here, and it turns out that there are, there are a lot of applications that we can't really solve. Um, so it turns out that machine learning does have its boundaries. So I want to give you a few examples of failure cases that show you the limits of these machine learning. So this is a really nice one from Siri. So this person says, you need to start understanding me, Siri. I'll make a note of that. Yeah, you may better make a note of that. And then this is what Siri does, right? So it kind of shows you that this algorithm doesn't really understand what you mean. It's trying to do a good job, but it kind of fails. I mean, I think a lot of people will maybe have seen uh, the, the duplex demo from Google. So they, they uh, introduced their new voice assistant, and they have a really impressive demo where a person is sort of asking the Google Assistant to book a hotel or to you know, reserve at a restaurant. And the chatbot, you know, it replies very impressively, but I think if you would sort of push that chatbot outside of its training domain and you would ask a question that's not about booking restaurants or hotels, it would start giving you very strange replies, right? So that's why it's a demo. It works really well if you stick to the training domain, but if you start asking more general questions, you're quickly going to find out that this thing is not really understanding what you mean. It was just very well trained on a specific data set. Some other cases are um, image understanding. So this is a data set where you give an image to a computer and you ask the computer to describe this image with a sentence. Uh, there was a really famous paper from 2015, and then they give it an image like this one, and the computer says, this is a person flying a kite on a beach, or this is a person skiing down a snow-covered slope. And then this hits the media, and you know, people start writing articles where you know, the title is, AI learns how to understand the world. And then people get all crazy, because this looks very impressive, right? But then, on the bottom of the article, there's a very small link to the paper, which nobody ever clicks. But if you click the paper, then you see these examples. And it says, a group of people standing on top of a beach. Well, kind of, but not really. Or an airplane is parked on the tarmac at an airport, right? Not what's going on. And so, what is happening here is kind of obvious. It was trained on a really big data set, where there were obviously airplanes parked on the tarmac, and what it has learned is that whenever there is an airplane in an image, and there is also asphalt, then quite likely this is going to be an airplane parked at an airport. Because this right here is not a very usual situation for an airplane to be in. So this algorithm never saw this in its training data, so it has no idea that this is an unusual place for an airplane to be. Right? And that's what we mean with the limits. It, it works very well if you stick to the training data, but as soon as you push it outside of that boundaries, then it's really failing to understand what's going on. Right? So there are very, very significant limits. Some other examples here is you train uh, a deep neural network to classify images, and you have three classes, for example, baseball, sunglasses, and matchstick. It does perfectly. You give it three images, and it perfectly classifies those images as being these three classes. But then people tried something else, and they tried to generate images to fool the network, and they come up with these examples. So they give it this image, and the network says with a very high certainty that this must be a baseball. This must be a pair of sunglasses, and this is probably a matchstick. 
And I think you can all understand why the network is fooled here. You know, there are these fringes here, and in all the images in the training data set, those fringes were also available on the baseball. So it basically says this must be a baseball because there is some uh, neuron in the network that learned to detect these fringes, and that also fires the baseball category. You can also see what's happening here for the sun classes and for the matchstick. So in these cases, the reason why the network makes a mistake is kind of obvious. It's intuitively clear what's going on. But it turns out in the same paper, there were a bunch of other examples where it's much less clear what is going on. So here, every single one of these images, if you feed it to the network, it will spit out the category that's below it. And for some of them, for example, the computer keyboard, it's kind of still intuitively clear. I mean, this might look like a keyboard if you really wanted to, but this one, for example, does not look at all like an assault rifle, right? So this is a big problem because it turns out that there are many ways that you can actually fool one of these networks to make a completely wrong prediction. And this shows us that there's some very different things going on which are not really happening in our visual brain, uh, but which these networks are clearly um, have problems with. Uh, there's one last example that I want to show which is even more impressive. So you take an image like this one, you give it to a network and it says this is a panda bear. I'm really confident this must be a panda bear. Then you take a different image which looks like this. So it's completely random noise. Well, in fact, it's not random noise. This, this image was very specifically engineered for a purpose. And the purpose is that you give this image to the network and it says nematode. And nematode apparently is some kind of worm. I don't know, it's a worm. But it's very unconfident. It doesn't really... It says, like, it could be a worm, but really I'm not sure what this is, right? So that's all fine. But then it turns out, if you take these two images and you add them together, but what you do is, with every pixel value in this image here, you first multiply it with a very small number. The result is that you get an image on the right side which looks identical to the panda bear, right? Because you take these pixel values and you multiply, you add this one, but you multiply it with a very small number, so actually the pixel values have only changed a tiny, tiny amount. So to our visual system, it's exactly the same image. But if you give this image to the network, it suddenly says this is an airplane, and it's 99% certain that this thing is an airplane, right? So this is what we call adversarial examples, and it's been you know, recently discovered and you can obviously see this is a big problem. And the biggest problem here is that to our visual system, it's exactly the same image. That's the danger, because we don't see this as, as a problem, right? This is still a panda bear. But to the network, all of a sudden, there's an airplane right there. So that's kind of a big problem. Uh, and then people have said, okay, this is kind of, uh, it's kind of surprising, but this is only a problem in, in the digital world where you have images. Well, it turns out that if you take an image, you create this adversarial example, and then you print that image with a printer, and you use a camera, then it's still an adversarial example. So this is not just a problem in the digital world, it's also a problem in the physical world. Because if you think about a stop sign, for example, if we're gonna be driving around in self-driving cars in the near future, then obviously we want those self-driving cars to recognize stop signs. But if you can stick a poster on that stop sign and all of a sudden the self-driving car doesn't recognize that stop sign anymore, this is a really, really big problem, right? So it's been this, this kind of strange development in machine learning where people were served first, they were very afraid, like, okay, this is a very big problem. And now it's turning out that because of this, we're actually discovering a lot of new things about these networks and we're actually building networks that are much better than the previous ones because we actually try to tackle these, these flaws, right? So a lot of cool things are, are happening there. Um, now a little bit to the, to the more um, business side. So even though we have a lot of flaws left in machine learning, it's definitely not perfect as I've showed, I would say that machine learning is really penetrating all kinds of different businesses, right? A lot of companies are realizing that they have a lot of data and they have to start using uh, machine learning to get value out of that data. Um, so I would say that liftoff has happened. Uh, if you look at, for example, uh, Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, he said in 2016 that we will move from a mobile first to an AI first world. And I think this has already happened in part. Uh, if you go to uh, Google Trends, which is, you know, you can search how popular keywords are on Google, then it turned out that the keyword machine learning actually surpassed the keyword big data uh, somewhere last year, right? So machine learning is already a more popular search term than the word big data is. Uh, so a lot of people are realizing, okay, we have big data now, but in order to get value out of it, we need machine learning. For people who are wondering, I was, what these drops are, apparently they're Christmas. Nobody cares about machine learning <laughs> when, it's, when it's Christmas. Um, so we have all these really big digital companies, and I think all of these companies are realizing that a very significant part of their value is in the data that they own, 
And they're all trying to leverage the value of that data by using machine learning in terms of recommendation engines and other services, right? Um, so liftoff has happened, but we are definitely not in stable orbit yet. Something I want to highlight here is that if you look at China, for example, a lot of people underestimate how fast China is going. If you look at the market cap of a lot of these Chinese companies, like uh, Tencent, Baidu, Alibaba, these companies are huge in comparison to their American counterparts. They're almost as big as uh, Google, for example. Um, and so if you look at the search keyword machine learning on Google, the number one country where people are using this Google search term is in China. There is no other country in the world where the keyword machine learning, obviously the Chinese translation of that keyword, is used more than in China. The second country is Singapore, then apparently St. Helens for some reason, South Korea, India, but you can see that Europe or America is nowhere in this top five, right? So these Asian countries, they are really, really moving very fast. In fact, I would say that right now, if I were to say who is leading the AI race, it's still America and Canada, but that's going to change in a few years. If you look at uh, the ImageNet competition that I started the slide deck with, this year, a Chinese team won the competition. So not an American team, not a Canadian team, it was a Chinese team that won. So you can see there that the government is really, they're placing an enormous amount of funding. They're actually, um, they're going to start... Um, uh, enforcing all the uh, middle schools in China to actually give a machine learning course in their educational program. So I, did, I studied civil engineering in Belgium. For me, machine learning was an optional course in my last master's year. And in China, they want to introduce it as a standard course in the middle, middle schools, right? So just to show you kind of how fast these countries are going. Um, data is the new gold or the new oil is kind of a, a buzzword you hear quite often. Um, but I think what we're seeing, I really like this, um, this analogy, is that if you look at 100 or 200 years ago, for example, what people did is they were very afraid of banks. They didn't trust the banks. So what they did with their savings is they dug a really big hole in their backyard and they put their money in this, in this box and they buried it in the backyard. And then we started realizing, hey, banks are actually not that bad. They're pretty good at you know, generating um, kind of a... Uh, a little bit of return on invest for me, my money is safe there, I have some legal guarantees. So I think everybody here has its money in the bank, probably, hopefully, right? And I think the same situation is happening with the cloud. Right now, a lot of companies are very afraid of the cloud because, you know, there's issues with data privacy, uh, security and all that. But I think, you know, very slowly we're seeing this transition where companies are realizing that the cloud offers a lot of benefits, right? There's a lot of scalability, it's cheaper, you don't need your own hardware team. There's a lot of benefits, but the transition is a very slow one. Especially in Europe, this transition is going much slower than in the US or in China, for example. So what I always do is I add one slide, join the cloud side, just consider it. Do a proof of concept, try it out. Because a lot of companies are really afraid and they wait and they wait and they wait until all their competitors are in the cloud and then it's kind of too late because you already lost this advantage. So just consider it. That's all I'll say. All right, so that was a little bit about deep learning. Um, now I want to dive a little bit into two uh, slightly different uh, areas of machine learning that I find really interesting. So the first one is generative networks and the second one is um, reinforcement learning. So generative networks. Um, everything I've talked about so far is what I like to call static inference, which means you take some input data, it could be an image or an audio file, a sentence, anything at all, you send it through your network and you get a label. Something like you know, a, a label for an image, for example, uh, or, or the translation of a sentence. Uh, what generative network do is kind of the opposite. They start from something that's really small and very simple, and they try to generate data that matches this. So for example, what you can use generative networks for is to generate images for you. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a one slide on what is going on because I find the paradigm is kind of interesting and actually not that difficult to understand. So in these, what they call GANs, you actually have two neural networks. You have this guy right here, which they call the generator, and this guy right there, which is called the discriminator. So those are two neural networks. This generator, basically his job is to generate images. So it's going to try and create images. And the discriminator right here has one job, it needs to look at an image and tell if that image is fake or real. So to do that, it has a database of actual images coming from the real world, and it will get an image at its input, but it doesn't know if that image came from the database or from the generator. And the only thing the discriminator needs to learn to tell is look at that image and tell if it was real or fake. So it needs to decide, you know, that image that I'm seeing, did it come from the real world database or did it come from the generator? 
And so it turns out that if you start with these two neural networks, they're both really bad. This guy is very bad at generating images, and this guy is very bad at seeing the difference between real and fake ones. But if you can balance them out and you start training both of these networks, they both get better. And this one, his only job is to create images that fool the discriminator to think that whatever it's generating is actually a real image. And so it turns out that if you do this for long enough, the generator learns magically how to generate realistic looking images. So I want to show you a little bit of the progress that we're seeing in, in, this, in this field because it's kind of impressive. So this was a paper uh, where they trained the network to generate pictures of bedrooms, for example. So you can look at this from a distance and you can say, well, yeah, it kind of looks like a bedroom, right? There's a bed and there's a window and stuff like that. But if you zoom into these pictures and you really look at them, they're kind of strange, right? They're not, you can see that they're not real images, but they get very close. Um, and to give you an idea of the progress in this field, the first paper that introduced generative networks was in 2014. There was a guy, Ian Goodfellow, who introduced it, and these were the images that they generated. So the images are 64 by 64 pixels, so kind of small. They're also grayscale, and if you look at them, well, they're not really impressive, right? I can probably draw this with paint. Then there was a research group that took on this idea and they started working on it. They started improving this technique and they came up with this paper in 2015. Okay, the images are still the same resolution, but they're in color right now. And there's a few of them that look a little bit more convincing. Okay, some of them are very strange. I don't know what this guy is doing, but they're a little bit better. Right? So that was 2015. This was a paper from 2016. You can see here the resolution is, has doubled, so this 20, 128 by 128 pixels, and these images look kind of convincing, right? They're a lot better than the previous ones. And now this is a paper from November 2017, right? The resolution of these images is 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. This was a paper from NVIDIA, and it was trained on a single GPU. So even the computational power you need to do this is not that impressive. They trained it for a few weeks, but on a single GPU. And if I were to give you these images, I think it's really hard to tell if they're real or fake. So every single one of those people does not exist. They were completely generated by a neural network. And you can see, if you look at the progress, 2014, 15, 16, 17, how fast this is going, right? So that's why I think this is a really interesting area to look at, because right now it's still kind of limited. But I think in a few years' time, you're going to be able to do amazingly cool things with generative networks. So, to give you some examples, I think it's pretty likely that in the future, if you want to buy a piece of furniture, what you're going to do is you're going to take a picture of your living room, you're going to go to the online catalog of this uh, company, you're going to select a sofa, and then the network is going to generate a picture of what your living room would look like if you bought that sofa. Right? Something like this. Or imagine you go to a retail website, and for the ladies, you want to buy a new dress. Well, you can pick a dress, you can upload a picture of yourself, and then the generative network will generate an image of what you would look like wearing that dress, for example. There's already people that do this. There's companies, startups working on this. The problem is right now, the images that you generate are usually low resolution. But if you simply look at the progress, it's not going to take very long until these things are become very, very convincing. There is also a downside to this, which is, of course, that because of these networks, it's starting to become really easy to fake stuff. So if you want to create a fake video of Barack Obama saying whatever you want, well, it's not going to take very long before every single one of us can do this on a laptop, right? So there's a nice side about it, but there's also this really dark side. And I think this is going to be really interesting to look at what's going to happen in, in this space. Um, yeah, this is a little bit of a gift. So the, the network, you can see here how long it's been training. And in the beginning, it's sort of very pixelated. And then as you progress, it starts getting uh, really good at generating faces. Um, so here, as a comparison, for example, all the images on the top are fake, and all the images in the bottom are actual people, right? So, I don't know, it's really, really hard to tell the difference. Um, to give you some other examples of stuff you can do with uh, generative networks, um, this is a cool example where the uh, images in the corners here, these three are real images, and everything in between was generated. So basically, you can start interpolating between faces, and only the three corners are actual, actual people, right? Kind of funny. There's a face app uh, that you can download for free. You can upload your own face, and there's a generative network that can sort of generate morphed, morphed versions of your own face. If you want to try it, it's completely free and a lot of fun to play with. Um, there's also networks where you can 
uh, give a network a sentence, and this, and this network will generate an image that matches your sentence. So here, you give it a description of some bird. The bird is short and stubby with yellow, and then it generates an image, for example. You can still see it's not perfect, but again, remember the progress. It will not take very long before these things get really, really good. Some other things people are doing with GANs is, for example, right now, if you go to Google and you download an image, uh, Google will take that image, it will get rid of 75% of the pixels, so it will create a low-resolution version. It will send it through you over uh, the wireless internet connection, and then in your phone, there's a generative network that takes the low-resolution image and generates the full resolution. So you can basically reduce the bandwidth usage of, uh, with a really large factor and still get high-resolution images in your phone. Right? Another example. Um, I don't know for people who know the Prisma app. It's a really fun app where you can create these uh, kind of artistically looking images from pictures, it also uses a generative network. Uh, there are things like uh, photo style transfer, so you take a style photo, you take a content photo, and then you can actually create a stylized version of that picture, right? So a lot of cool, cool examples here, also using generative networks. Uh, some other stuff is um, you can take uh, an image map like this one, so a segmentation map, and then you can have a generative network sort of try and transform this thing into something that looks realistic. What people are using this for is surprising. They are creating these segmented versions on video games, so games like Grand Theft Auto, for example, and then they're using a generative network to turn those uh, into images, and then on those images, they're training self-driving car software. So that's a really cool way, because the nice thing is, in Grand Theft Auto, you know where the people are, you know where the trees are, you know what the pavement is, you know everything, and then you just use a gun to generate realistically looking footage. There's other stuff where you can create a small sketch, for example, and then the generative network will make a picture of what that sketch would look like if you were to actually manufacture uh, that piece. Um, some other stuff is, for example, we're uh, going to see a new introduction, a new uh, Photoshop 2.0, where you can basically crop uh, a part of an image and ask the network to fill in whatever would be there. Right? And so if you look at this example, for, for example here, it's kind of funny. It imagines that there must be some person there, probably a singer, but he's apparently missing legs. Like, there's not really a body attached to that face, right? So again, these networks are not perfect yet, but remember the pace of progress. It won't take very long until these things are starting to look really convincing. And here, for example, this network does a really good job at filling in the blanks. Um, yeah. Basically, I tried to sketch a little bit of the overview of what you can do with generative networks, but the application potential is enormous. I mean, people are using this for fraud detection uh, in the medical world to, to you know, come up with new uh, drugs, new antibiotics. So basically, it's a really powerful method because this network can just learn from data what would, what would new data look like. And then obviously, in the drug discovery case, for example, you want to create new drugs, and then you want to have them have specific properties, right? So what people are doing right now is they have a specific bacteria, which they want to treat with an antibiotic. And they train a neural network to generate antibiotics. And then they have a different network that can classify the properties of that antibiotic. And then they can actually come up with very specific compounds to treat specific diseases. So there's a lot of work going on in, in generative networks. It's it's still early, but I think this is going to be like a really interesting area to follow. Um, okay, reinforcement learning. Um, I don't know if there are any questions, by the way, because I didn't really mention this in the beginning, but if you have questions, raise your hands. Don't be afraid to, uh, to interrupt me. I have this very nice thing which I can throw at you, and then you can apparently speak into it. So don't, don't be afraid to, to uh, interrupt me if you want to. Um, Okay, so reinforcement learning. That's kind of the area that I am working in right now in my PhD. Um, so obviously I'm excited about it. And I also think a lot of people sort of uh, are thinking about the applications of this because it's super, super cool. So reinforcement learning. This is a really nice example to explain what reinforcement learning is. Um, basically, it's a dynamic world. You have a camera system right here that is filming whatever it's seeing. So it's detecting the ball and the person here. And you have an output, which is a robotic arm that it can sort of control. And so this system is it's doing actions. So it's, it's creating and generating outputs out of this neural network. And the outputs are the robotic actions of the arm. 
And the, these actions actually affect the world that this network is operating in. And because it's, it, it's affecting the world, this has a feedback loop into the camera, which is giving it input signals, and you have this continuous loop. That's, that's what we call reinforcement learning. So instead of this input, go through the network, you have an output, reinforcement learning is this dynamic loop. Right? So you can look at this um, in a more simple way. You have an agent, which is your neural network. It does some actions. These actions affect the environment, and then the environment changes, and you have some state, which could be you know, the visual scene or whatever other uh, sensors you attach here. So this could be the camera. And then what you get from your uh, environment is usually what we call a reward, so you want it to do something. And in this case, the reward could, for example, be, well, every single time you manage to hit the ping pong ball, you get a reward, right? And you want to train your agent so that it can learn to use the camera to be able to play ping pong. That's kind of the general idea. Um, so people first um, demonstrated that this has a lot of potential uh, at Google DeepMind. So there was a really famous paper in 2015 where they showed that you can use um, reinforcement learning to play really simple video games. So this was a very um, famous video game from the Atari console. I'm not old enough to have played on this, but apparently a lot of people know it. Um, and this is what the network is doing after 10 minutes of training, right? So it's really bad. It misses half of the balls and it hits sometimes, but it's actually really bad. If you let it train for about two hours, it's almost as good as a human professional gamer, right? It hits almost all of the balls back. It's really fast, good reaction time. Um, it's doing a good job. And then what they did is they let it train for a little longer, and apparently this thing came up with the strategy that if it digs a tunnel here, all of a sudden it doesn't really have to do anything anymore, right? And the people who were looking at this network were like, wow, that's really clever. We never thought of doing this. And you, you need a lot of skill to be able to actually aim the ball this way. But once you get it up there, you don't have to do anything anymore. So kind of a nice solution. Um, what reinforcement learning is really good at is, is solving these very complicated games. So I think we all know um, IBM's Deep Blue chess computer that beat Kasparov in 1997. Um, if you look at what Deep Blue was doing, basically a lot of compute. Just try everything, brute force it with a lot of compute, try all the options. There's a few clever tricks in there, of course, but the main reason they were able to beat Kasparos is because they had a lot of computers. Now, you have this other game, which is called Go. It's kind of, um, it's similar to chess. I mean, a lot of people would say that's an understatement, but it's kind of the Asian version of chess, and it's a lot more complicated. Why is it more complicated? Well, if you look at chess, for example, uh, we have this number called the branching factor, which says how many moves are possible in a given chess position. And apparently in chess, the, the branching factor is something like 35, which means that if you're looking at a chessboard, there's about 35 different moves that you should consider uh, if you want to think ahead. Right? Obviously, if you're a good player, you can eliminate some of them, but for a computer, you have to check all those 35 moves. So that means if you want to think three or four moves ahead, you want to think 35 times 35 times 35, so you have this explosion of what you have to check, right? And so in Go, the branching factor is 250. That's what makes this problem so hard. A Go board is much, much bigger, so you have 250 moves at every step. So if you want to think two moves ahead, you have to go over 250 times 250 options. If you want to think 20 moves ahead, that's impossible. In fact, people have calculated there are more possible Go positions than there are atoms in the universe. So it's absolutely impossible to do this with brute force, right? And so people have been thinking about, you know, when would an AI be able to beat the human uh, professional at a game like Go? And people were saying, yeah, it's going to take at least, you know, 20 or 30 more years before we have computers that are powerful enough to do this. And as many of you will probably have seen in the news, you know, last year, Google DeepMind actually beat uh, the best Asian player in uh, Go, right? And so the reason that we're able to do this is because of reinforcement learning. I'm going to spend like one minute on this slide because I find it really interesting what they did. So they had a first version of the bots and basically what they did is they went to some Chinese website that had a lot of very good Go players. They went to that website and they asked them, hey, can we buy all your game data? Can we just buy all the games that the professional players play on your website because we want to train a machine learning algorithm that looks at a board position and predicts the move of this professional human player. So basically, it's going to look at a board, and whatever the network tries to do is predict what the human pro did next. That's, that's what they did. So they train a network to predict uh, the next move, and at the same time, they also train another network to look at the board and decide who is probably going to win. Is black going to win or is white going to win? That's the value network. 
So look at this board position and you know, estimate who's ahead, white or black. Then once they had this, it, it was fully trained, it was just as good as a human professional, obviously because they trained from human pros. And then what they did is they took this network and they had it play against itself. So they had it play against its own, uh, you know, a copy of itself, and then it started getting better and better by just playing against itself. And so it turns out if you do this for long enough and you are called Google and you have a lot of computers to do this, then it turns out you can actually make a network that's a lot better than the best humans. So in 2016, they were able to beat um, Lisa Dole in Korea, uh, which was kind of a really impressive thing for AI. I think a lot of bells went ringing then when people said, okay, reinforcement learning has a lot of potential, right? Uh, if you don't know what to do tonight, there is a Netflix documentary which is super interesting, right? There is this uh, famous documentary on AlphaGo, and it's not technical at all, it's super interesting to see what went on there. Super cool. Um, so the main application area that I see right now uh, that is going to emerge from reinforcement learning is in robotics. So I'll go over this a little bit. So what we're doing in, uh, in our lab, for example, is running these simulations where we try to get a simulated robot to learn how to walk, for example. Right? So you can see that if you're trained for one generation, it just falls over. But as you keep training it, it suddenly learns how to walk. Right? It's kind of interesting. You have other of these examples where you have a little robot that needs to walk, for example, and you give it all these kind of perturbations, and most of the time it learns how to manage to deal with those perturbations. Not always. Uh, and then at Google, for example, they're training these robotic arms to, for example, pick up objects. So you can see that we're still doing relatively simple stuff, right? Is learning how to pick up an object. And to give you a sense of scale here, they had about 200 of these robotic arms trained for a couple of weeks before they were able to pick up really simple objects. So if you compare this with a young kid, for example, they learn this much, much faster, right? So we're definitely still very far away from, from what humans can do, but we're seeing you know, a lot of progress towards useful applications. And obviously, things that are going to become very possible in the near future is robots that can, for example, learn how to pick an apple, right? Um, now, what I always get after my talks is a lot of people that get very, very frightened about all these you know, robots getting smarter. Uh, and so they ask me, you know, when are robots going to take over uh, the world? And so I think a lot of you will have seen this uh, video from Boston Dynamics, right? It's this robot uh, that is apparently really good at jumping, and it manages to do a backflip right here. Um, and then you know, people see this and they think, OK, the Terminator is really, really close. We're, we're doomed. Now, the thing I always want to mention about this work here is that there is very little intelligence in this robot. What the researchers here did is they put this robot on the bench, they wrote a piece of software that sort of does a backflip, they run it on the robot, and the robot crashed on its face. They went back to the software, they changed a few numbers, they try it again. It crashes again. They go back to the program. They did this for a whole bunch of iterations until finally it was able to do one successful backflip. They filmed it, they put it online, the video went viral. Okay? So if you were to reduce the height of this bench by just five inches, the guy would crash again. So there is very little intelligence going on because it's just a hard-coded program. program. Where, anyway, and this is why this, this Terminator scenario is kind of fake in the media because this robot is doing very, very little self-driven intelligence. This is another video from the RoboCup uh, soccer competition. <laughs> and this is, these are robots that are doing self-control. So these are robots that are actually taking their own actions based on camera input, right? <laughs> and I think, I think this was the competition in 2016. So probably uh, we're doing a little bit better right now. But I just want to show this gap between what the media is picturing versus the reality. Okay? So we're still not there yet. It's really, really difficult to get a robot to do anything sensible. Right? Okay, let's go to a little bit of uh, some applications. Um, one famous example was, for example, Google DeepMind. What they did is uh, Google has a lot of these data centers, and there's a lot of compute uh, racks there that get really hot. So they're, they're doing a lot of computation. They consume a lot of energy. They get really hot. And so all these compute racks, they have fans that are spinning to cool them down. And that's really one of the highest energy costs in the Google data centers is to keep all the chips cool. And so these, these data centers, they were designed by really, really clever engineers that know a lot about data center cooling. Um, and so it turns out that 
they had an idea like, why don't we have this entire cooling system be run by a computer algorithm, by a reinforcement learning algorithm? And so they trained this system. Basically, it had two rules. Keep every chip below a certain threshold temperature, because otherwise, you know, these chips are going to break. But other than that, use as little energy as possible. That was the goal of this reinforcement learning agent. And it was able to control the rotation speed and the direction of every single fan in the data center. So this thing, they, Google basically said, look, we'll give you this one data center in Poland. You can do whatever you want there for a few weeks. And if you get some promising results, we'll think about scaling this up to the other data centers. And it turned out that by using a reinforcement learning algorithm, they were able to reduce the energy um, consumption of this data center by 40%, 40 percent, four zero percent. And so you have to think about this data center, it's from Google. So it was designed really, really well. This is not a shitty data center, right? These people knew what they were doing. And even then, they were able to reduce it by 40%. And so they were really surprised, like, how can we get 40% out of this? And so they kind of looked at what the algorithm was doing. And apparently, um, the engineers basically put a single fan on every compute rack, and it was just blowing straight down, cooling this single rack. What the algorithm figured out is that if you sort of point all the fans in the same direction, you can create an airflow inside the data center, and you can sort of suck cold air from the windows and actually push the cold air through the compute racks and then get hot air that leaves the building on the other side. So they basically created a complete circulation inside the building drastically increasing this cooling efficiency, right? So that's this kind of unintuitive solution, which is kind of hard to find if you were to manually start changing these fans. But by just giving control to an algorithm, you can sometimes get very surprising results. So it's kind of a nice, a nice um, setting. We are also doing something similar right now in, in manufacturing companies where you know, a lot of these companies, they have production lines that all generate data at every single point. And then at the end of their line, they have some product that they want to ship. And what they usually do is every single day, for example, they would take a few of those projects, uh, products from a batch, they'll send it to a lab to do some chemical testing, and then maybe the next, week, uh, the next day or the next week, they get those lab results, and then they know if they can actually ship that batch to customers or if something went wrong and they have to redo the thing. So the problem is right here that this is very high cost and low volume, right? It costs a lot of money to do those tests. It's also low volume. And so our idea was, why don't we try and use all the sensor data that you're generating in that process to predict the lab results based on that sensor data? And so it turns out that for some of these lab results, you can actually do really good predictions just based on the sensor data that you're capturing during that process. Not for all of them. Some of those metrics are just really hard to predict uh, ahead of time. But a lot of these metrics can be produced ahead of time. And so what we're doing right now is we have a machine learning system that's just doing online predictions for every single product rolling off the line. And they can take really quick actions. Whenever they see that some of those predictions are out of spec, they have a flag, a red flag going up on their dashboard. They can look at what's going on and they can fix the problem immediately rather than having to wait for another week before they get their lab results. Right? So this is a really cool project and it's actually scalable to a lot of different industries. So you don't have to think this is only applicable in industrial applications. It's really broad. Right? Um, and then actually we're also thinking right now is, okay, what if we can predict the lab results, then based on those results, the people on the floor actually change uh, something about the production line. Can we also adjust these process parameters directly from the machine learning? So there's a lot of options in that industry. The main challenge in manufacturing right now is that the data that they have is usually in 25 different places, right? They have 17 databases on this place, they have a few other databases, and it's really hard to collect everything together and start doing a machine learning project that has access to everything. That's usually the main bottleneck. So the theory is not the problem, the problem is the data, as always. Um, so these smart factories, you know, China is doing a lot of work there. They're actually uh, ahead, I would say, in front of um, America and, and Europe. But definitely these things are being applied in industry. Um, we have a product. If you want to check the website, ecc.ai, you can check it out. Uh, this is kind of what I am working on in my PhD and what we're trying to launch as, as a company. Um, another cool project we've used Ekai for is uh, in um, wind farms, so offshore wind farms. Um, the thing is that all these wind farms, they have turbines that can control uh, the pitch of their blades and the actual bearing of the rotor blades. And what the algorithm figures out right now is it has one goal, is to maximize the energy efficiency of the park. And basically on the ocean you have a lot of wind gusts that are sort of in unpredictable. 
But the algorithm sort of figures out that the wind gusts get detected first by the turbines at the edge of the park, and then it can send signals to all the other turbines, watch out guys, there's a wind uh, gust coming, and they can sort of change their uh, actual bearing a little bit to maximally catch that wind gust. And now the efficiency gains that you get from this are really small. Usually we're talking one, two, or three percent. But if you think about the energy efficiency of 1% on a yearly scale, that is a lot of extra revenue, right? And the hardware is already there, the park is built, so the only thing you have to do is use the data to get more value out of it. So a lot of times this actually generates a lot of extra revenue. Okay, the final part of my talk um, has a few of these practical uh, advices. Um, so. The first step is always to look at what data do you have, because people usually start from dreams, what they would like to be able to do, and then the conclusion is usually that in order to do that, they don't have the data that you need to train a system. So what I always say is think about what data do you have right now, not tomorrow, not the next week, but right now, what is already there. Then what can we do with that data? Do, you have, do we have ideas? That's why I gave this general overview of a lot of things that are possible with machine learning. And again, I will repeat, try to read up on it. Just spend an hour or half an hour a week, read up on things you can do with machine learning, and you'll quickly get a feel of what you can do with the data. <coughs> then the biggest problem is usually how do we extract that data from all the different sources that we capture it, and how do we centralize it? Because that's really important. Usually, if you want to do machine learning, you have to get all your data into some central repository so that you can actually access it uh, for a lot of different projects. And the cloud is a good solution for this, but not all companies are kind of ready for this. And then if you don't actually have the necessary data right now, what data do we need to start logging and how do we generate good data? Because obviously machine learning is very bad at dealing with messy data. Your data has to be really clean. For example, in a lot of these manufacturing companies, we have this sensor and it's logging temperatures for a few months and then all of a sudden they, they decided that they replaced the sensor with a different sensor and then in the database you see this gap. Well, that's annoying. Machine learning is not very good at dealing with messy data, but the real world is messy. That's, that's a big challenge. Um, a lot of companies also think that in order to do machine learning, they need to get a lot of labeled data. Um, but this is kind of a flaw, so let me show you one example here. What they did here is they trained a drone to fly around in a forest. So the drone was simply trained to um, follow a hiking trail inside the forest. So here you see the drone. Um, and so basically what you, what you have to think about is how do you train a system like this? So the drone has a camera, it gets a frame, and it needs to decide do I go left, right, or do I keep going straight? So the first idea would be, okay, you can start taking pictures in the forest and then you can start labeling every single one of those images, whether you should go left, right, or stay straight, right? But the problem, this is a lot of work. How the paper here solved this is with this guy. They asked one guy if he wanted to go hike in this forest. They gave him this, um, this GoPro rig where you have a camera on the right, one in the middle and one on the left side. And basically what they did after walking, they just told the guy, keep the camera rig straight ahead. So that means that every single frame from this camera is labeled as keep going straight. You're in the middle of the road. Every frame from this camera is go a little bit to the left because you're on the right side of the trail. And here you have all the other examples. So they had this guy walk around in the forest for a single hour. They had a database of 100,000 labeled images, and they were able to train their drone to follow the hiking trail. So that's one example where you can be really clever in how you generate your data, but sometimes you have to find these, these creative tricks. Another example is, for example, we had a company uh, that wanted to create a, um, a bottle sorter. So they have a lot of pet bottles, and they want to sort them into different types. Uh, and they said, like, okay, we have to create a data set of you know, 20 million labeled examples. We can never do this, uh, so we're going to postpone the project. And so we went there and we said, look, if you look at an image classifier, you can download pre-trained classifiers that were trained on millions of data points, right? So the thing is that all these networks layers in the beginning, they're doing very general stuff. These networks, they have very simple feature detectors that are applicable in any data set. Whether you're detecting faces or pet bottles or cars, it doesn't matter. These things are useful. It's only the final layers that are very specific for the thing you care about. So what you can do is you can actually take a pre-trained network, keep all these layers fixed, and only train this part of the network, and then you need a lot less data. So what we did there is we had a cardboard box of 150 pet bottles, 
We took every pet bottle out, we dropped it on the floor, we took a camera, and we made a small video clip of that pet bottle, then we put the video clip on the computer, we extract all the frames from that video clip, so now we have 5,000 images of the same pet bottle from all different angles and distances, and they're all labeled, because you know what that bottle was. So in about one hour, we created a data set of 50,000 images, and by the end of the day, we had a classifier that had 97% accuracy in classifying pet bottles. So that's what I mean with generating data. You need labeled training data, but you can oftentimes be really clever in how you do it. And obviously it's not easy, but there's a lot of tricks that you can read about. So deep learning doesn't require millions of labeled, of hand-labeled examples. It needs a lot of data and some clever engineering. Um, I'm going to go a little bit faster because I see probably we're almost at the end of the hour, and I still want to have a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, but what I see is that a lot of companies are afraid to release their data. Uh, in Belgium, it's the worst of all, really. Belgium is really bad. Uh, there's a lot of other countries where people are sort of, yes, ready for it, and in the United States, they already did it, right? So I don't know, for people who know the Kaggle website, it's basically a website where companies can put their data online. They have some kind of a challenge with your data, and then there are teams from all over the world that try to tackle that challenge with your data, and you only pay the winning team. So this is genius, right? Because you have thousands of teams working for you for free, and you only pay the best team at the end. So it's super genius. And obviously, if you upload your data there, you can first anonymize it if that's, if that's an issue. Um, going to skip this part. A lot of companies also come to us, and they have this really complicated SQL database, which is like a super interesting schema. And then they say, look, this is our login, and this is our host name, and just go ahead and do some machine learning for us, right? That's when I get really, really depressed. Like, if you're a machine learning engineer, you don't want to do this, right? This is something that should be managed by people who know the database. What we like to have is a really big CSV file with clean data. And obviously, this is not very easy to get, but that's kind of what you need if you want to do machine learning. And I realize that in most companies, going from this to this, that is one of the biggest challenges, right? A lot of work goes into data cleaning and gathering and centralizing everything. Um, so, f one final word on my company, it's called ML6, you can go to the website, ml6.eu. Uh, so, we are still a small company, we're like 20, 25 people, uh, based in Ghent, Belgium, and we just specialize in doing machine learning for, for other companies. Uh, I have a few quick use cases. Uh, for example, we did something for a shipping company. What they do is they ship products from Asia to uh, Europe and to the United States. And they had a big problem that all their packets, their parcels, they were sometimes being stopped at border control. And so what they wanted to do, the problem with that is that they, they book an airplane, so they don't have their own airplanes, they book an airplane. And if a lot of those parcels get stopped at border control, then they have an airplane that's flying with 95% capacity. So it's not full. And this costs them money. So basically they said, like, okay, we have a really large database, we have been logging all our parcels for the past five years. For every parcel, we know the weight, the size, a description, we have a picture of it, we know where it's coming from, where it's going to. Why don't we use all of this information uh, and we try to predict the package delay in the customs, right? And so it turns out you cannot do this very accurately for a single package, but you can if you have a full airplane that's based out of you know, 50,000 packages. Then you can very accurately predict when you should charter that airplane in order to get it full. Right? So now they use a network like this in order to do their bookings. And you know, something like this is perfectly applicable to you know, stock management or uh, predictions of you know, from all these variable kind of things. Another thing we did for London was uh, traffic uh, congestion prediction. So they have a lot of loops on the road. When a car drives over them, it gives a pulse. Um, and basically, we had a whole bunch of data of the traffic situation in London for the past year. And we trained a network to look at the current traffic situation and try to predict what's the situation going to be in 30 minutes from now. And so it turns out the network is relatively good at you know, seeing trends in traffic. But the really surprising thing is when the network was very, very wrong. Because sometimes we have this prediction, OK, the traffic situation is going to be like this in 20 minutes. And then 20 minutes later, the traffic situation is very, very different. And then we kind of looked at why is this happening, and it turns out that in most cases, the network was very wrong because something unexpected happened. There was an accident on the road, for example. So what we have right now is a dashboard that is doing predictions, and then 20 minutes later, you check if those predictions are actually correct, and if they aren't, then you have an automatic pop-up of the camera on the road, and you see what's going on. So right now, they immediately get a pop-up whenever an accident happens somewhere, and then they can take very, very concrete actions. And the next step in this project is to um, actually use this model to directly control the traffic lights. 
So we want to be able to, whenever an accident happens, we want to use our model to predict how this traffic jam is going to spread across the city, and then in real time adjust the traffic lights to optimize the traffic flow. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff we can do here, and the reason is because they build a really good database where all this data is coming in in real, real time and it's centralized in one specific location. Right? We've also built a lot of chatbots. Uh, I'm not going to go over this too much because chatbots are everywhere. A lot of companies are building them. Um, I'm, I think chatbots are a really good solution for 80% of your problems, and they're a very bad solution for 20% of your problems. Right? So what you want to do if you create a chatbot is have the easy stuff be dealt with automatically. Whenever it's a complicated question, send it to a human, or you will have very angry customers. Uh, we also did OCR projects where we have, this is a famous tower in Ghent, it stores uh, a lot of archives from historical times, but they're all these library cards, and they wanted to finally digitize everything. So basically we had uh, 20 million of these pictures, and we OCR'd everything. So now they have a complete digital database, and instead of actually having to take the elevator and go and look for this card, they can now just type a query, which is easier. Um, okay, so what, what do I think are some of the interesting things to remember? Um, media can be deceptive, so if you see something like this in the media, don't always believe what you see, because sometimes it's very different than what you think it is, right? This is not really impressive, but this is really impressive. And it's sort of difficult to see the difference if you don't really have the, you know, the background. The second thing is educate yourself. You know, I have a blog post on this called Catching the AI Train. You can uh, ask for it me later, but basically what I, what I recommend for a lot of people to do is, for example, there are very good mailing lists. And a mailing list is you give it your email address and every single week you will get uh, an email with, you know, something like 20 links to read on AI. And you can just scroll over it, see if something is interesting for you, click it, and then just read uh, 15 minutes. But the nice thing about these mailing lists is you get them every week. So if you're busy or you don't have any time, then you can just skip a week and you'll get a new email next week. They don't spam you, but they give you this constant feed of information. And if you do this for a while, you actually get a lot more insights in, into how all these things work. Um, there's a lot of open source tools available as well. You have these courses on Coursera, Udemy, Medium, uh, YouTube channels. So, you know, try and explore what's out there. The second thing is companies often don't see the difference between these two things. A lot of companies right now that I see are trying to automate stuff. So they have some kind of business process right now, and they want to use machine learning to automate it. So things like you know, packing up boxes, for example, uh, chatbots are very clear examples of automation. But the problem is everybody is doing automation with AI. Everybody is. The difficult thing is to try and do something new with AI that you couldn't do five years ago. So it's obviously much more difficult to come up with an innovative idea, but this is really where the companies that are going to make a difference are going to come ahead. Right? So think about, am I automating an existing process or am I, or am I doing something new? There's a big difference. And then the final thing is don't do everything alone. Because we see a lot of companies that um, they, uh, they want to train all their ITers to become really good machine learning experts. And they want to have their own infrastructure and they want to create their own machine learning library. And by the time they have all that, the open source community has moved on six months and they're really, really behind. So what we usually tell them is, look, you have these cloud platforms that are really good at doing hardware. You have open source projects like GitHub and you know, libraries like TensorFlow that are really good at software development. You have consulting companies like ourselves that are really good in developing all these things. Why would you do all of that yourself? Right? You can't do it because it's just moving too fast. So think about how you can collaborate instead of doing everything in-house. It's a, kind of an important message because it, even for us as a machine learning company, it's it's a real challenge to keep track of this amazing progress. Even me, sometimes, I mean, if I go on a vacation for a month and I come back, I am behind, really. I need to read up. So it's going so fast that if it's not your core business, it's usually not that smart to try and do everything in-house. Um, Previous to the last slide, this is my YouTube channel. If you are into the technical stuff and you kind of want to learn a little bit more about machine learning, um, I try to make these videos where I try to take the stuff that I find super interesting in research and I try to explain it in plain English. So if you want to check out my YouTube channel, you can do that. Uh, and these are some more of my contact informations. Thank you very much and I hope there are questions. Box. We're strategically located in uh, three sectors and uh, on the floor above, so okay. don't hesitate and raise your hand. I'm a good throw. 
Um, I would like to ask about Sorry, another map. Speak into the, into the mic. Oh, this is a mic? Yes. <laughs> All right, cool. Hello? Yeah. All right. I would like to ask about uh, another method of okay. machine learning, which is genetic algorithm. Yeah. I've heard about it a long time ago, but yeah. I've heard about it since then. Like, is it still used now? What's the update and stuff? Um, there's a lot of people working on genetic algorithms. Um, the thing is, if you have labeled training data, then back propagation is just much more efficient. It's faster. It works. But if you have a really complicated problem where you don't have any examples, then genetic algorithms, they can usually find good solutions. The only problem is you need massive amounts of computes. So genetic algorithms, they work, but they're less scalable. That's kind of the big problem. So if you have a problem where your input data is very small, then a genetic algorithm can be a really good fit. But if your data is something like images, for example, well, you can never train an image classifier with a genetic algorithm because it's just too big. So for some applications, it's really good. So for example, in reinforcement learning, a lot of people are working on genetic algorithms, and it's still not clear who's, who's going to win. I think right now there's really different, different applications for both. So it's definitely still used, but if you have labeled training data, then supervised learning is just more efficient. Um, I have a second question. Actually. Sure. Um, um, I've watched a video that, which is um, Facebook chatbot yeah. talking to each other. Um, so my question is um, whether or not it's possible in the future that machine learning or deep learning will generate an adversely unpredictable data out of it and it could be harming for the system itself. Well. I think you know, there was this example from uh, Microsoft released a bot on Twitter, I think it was last year, and what they did is they had this system learn from its interactions with people. And so in the beginning, the bot was trained on some very proper data, and it was a good chatbot, but then apparently the people that started you know, collaborating and chatting with this chatbot most often on Twitter were people that weren't really using proper language. So they were testing, for example, what, what if I start cursing against this chatbot? What will it answer? And then, you know, so people started interacting with this chatbot, but the, the majority of the people were not really having normal conversations. They were using curse words and all of these things. And because the bot was learning from its interactions, eventually it started using curse words itself, and then it completely escalated. So that's a clear example where if you don't really think ahead of time about what your system is going to do, it can create some very surprising situations, right? So it's dangerous. You have to, and that's probably the main issue with these machine learning systems. They all work really well if you develop them, but then you move them to production and things sometimes go wrong. So it's not easy. Yeah. Right. But in terms of AI versus AI, um, for example, in the Google Duplex demo, um, they, they gave an example where the, the, the chatbots can sort of call a restaurant and even if the restaurant would have like an automatic answering machine, the chatbot would still be able to make a reservation, for example. So definitely there are possibilities where these, these AIs can sort of uh, collaborate and, and do something useful together. But the feedback loop and retraining it is, is sometimes dangerous. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Throw it back. Or throw it to the next person. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, transparency. How do you make sure you always understand what the system is actually doing? Good question. Um, I actually ha I just came from a conference in Munich where my talk was on interpretability. Um, so there's a lot of research going on in interpretability because in a lot of applications it's crucial. If you think about medical applications, if this algorithm says that you have this disease and you have to take that drugs, you want to know why, right? You want your doctor to be able to validate that prediction. So I would say that we have come a long way. We have a really good understanding of what computer vision algorithms are doing in terms of image processing. If you think about something like you know, sequential decision making, it's much less clear what's going on. So it's still a very big problem. It's not clear at all, but we're making a lot of progress. And if I think about the amount of people that's working on this problem, I would estimate that in five years, we're going to have some really good um, insights into what these networks are doing, because it is a very crucial thing. Yeah. Person there? Where? Yeah, throw it. Like there? I can just speak. Actually. No, no. no, just throw it. Just, uh, okay. just throw it. <laughs> yeah. Don't be afraid. Hey. Yeah. Hi. Um, so you are doing PhD, and what work in machine learning really gets excited you personally? What do you think? Well, yeah. the nice thing I like about my PhD and reinforcement learning is that most of the applications right now are uh, developed on games. 
because games are easy, right? You can have a simulator and you can generate as much training data as you want, but what we're seeing right now is that all these algorithms that are developed for video games, people are now thinking about you know, transferring them to the real world, something like robotic tasks, for example. So it might seem very different on playing a video game versus you know, controlling a robotic arm to pick up an object, but it's the same algorithms that were used to play video games that you can now use to do robotic tasks. So I find it very interesting that we're seeing this transition from very simple video games to different applications in the real world, and there's a lot of extra challenges coming with that because the real world is messy and video games are easy and clean. Um, but it's nice to be, you know, looking at this whole range of problems that can be solved with the same underlying techniques. That's what I find super cool. And so currently, for example, there was a post from OpenAI yesterday where they showed that they're able to, you know, there's this really famous game, Dota 2. It's a 5v5 team game. And they actually showed that, you know, very recently they were able to beat uh, human teams, uh, 5v5 human teams. And the surprising thing about these networks is if you look at every single network, so it's a 5v5 game, it's a team game, every single one of those five players, the AI bot is actually much, it's, it's not as good as the humans, they're worse. But their team play is amazing. So it turns out that the, those networks, they don't have any selfish bias. So a human player is going to be afraid of dying. So it's going to sometimes you know, make, a, make a mistake to save his own life, but then the rest of his team might die. And it turns out that these AI systems, because they just care about winning the game and not about personal victories, they don't have any selfish biases, and they're much better at team play. And so I am kind of interested in what if we can apply these systems to global challenges of international politics and climate change because they don't have any selfish bias. So if you can just think about the general objective, then I think these, theme, you know, these systems are going to be really good additions to politics, etc., because they don't have this selfish bias. So I think there's, that's a really cool direction that I'm kind of surprised about. So if I understood you right, some kind of transfer learning from some simulation of politics, that's what you'd like to do? The thing is, transfer learning is one of those problems that is very, very much unsolved. There's a thousands of people working on it, but I haven't seen anything promising. So for people who don't know what transfer learning is, it's where you train an algorithm on one task, uh, like for example, um, snowboarding, and then you wanted to do something which is related, like skateboarding, and you hope that when it already knows how to do snowboarding, it's probably going to learn how to skateboard a little bit faster because those things are related. Well, currently, AI algorithms are really, really bad at this. If you train them on one task and then you try at something else which is similar, they will completely suck. So that's, that's transfer learning. And I haven't seen anything promising, but obviously it's one of those holy grails. If you can solve transfer learning, there's a lot of applications that become feasible. Yeah. Thanks. Any more questions? Right there, right there? Please. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, you said getting data. So getting data is not the problem, but using or getting usable data is the problem. So yeah. that is something that I'm faced with pretty much every day in which you, know, you have data in absolutely different forms. Sure. And if I'm looking at optimizing or streamlining a process, but not just one individual process, but like a series of processes. And you said, uh, you just said that transfer knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. is, transfer learning. Is, yeah. yeah, transfer learning is still a, a big question mark. How do I adapt the system in which it learns from the data that is What I would getting? say is you don't have one system, you just have a different system for everything you want to do. So the current best solution is not to train one system that's good at five things, but just train five different systems that all are good at what they're supposed to do. So I think it's going to take a few more years before that transfer learning problem really becomes you know, solved enough that you can apply it in practice. So right now, I would say try to split up your problems into sub-components mm -hmm. that are confined and train one network for every specific task. All right. Thank you. Right there. Thank you. Um, you showed us the network which recognized the numbers 0 to 9, yeah. and then the one that discovered which, what kind of car it was. Yeah. And just to get a feeling, how many hidden layers are there? Is it million layers or is no. it 10? Okay, it's a good question. So, uh, for example, the, the image classification, Amnist, 
the first time that people started working on this data set, the networks were really small because recognizing a written digit is kind of an easy thing, right? So there you have enough. If you just have three or four layers, your network is, is going to be able to solve the task. If you go to a data set like MNIST, which, uh, like ImageNet, for example, which has a thousand classes like cars and you know, animals and trees, things like that, then you need deeper networks. And usually, you know, the first winner on ImageNet used a network of something like, you know, anything between 10 or 50 layers. But now, you know, the current state of the art is that networks are getting much deeper. I think, you know, I've seen networks that are thousands of layers deep, but there are tricks being applied so that making them deeper isn't exactly the same as a normal deep network. There are a lot of tricks. And I would say for most practical applications, a 50-layer network can do what you want. Yeah. Thank you. There is a question right in front, the first row. Yeah. Nice catch. Nice throw. Nice yeah. Catch. So uh, you said, when you showed us uh, the, the different layers, you said that uh, they, they uh, train for a specific um, well, uh, we try to learn function. specific detectors. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Is, it, is the layer trained or does it train itself? It trains itself. So the only thing you feed it is the output, which you want, what you want the network to produce. So the label, so if you give it an image of a zero, you want it to give you a high number for that neuron zero. And everything in the middle of the network, you never touch it. So the, the, the things that it eventually learns are completely emergent out of the training algorithm. So you never specifically say, you should learn to do this. This is just something that emerges out of training. Yeah, but uh, so how, how do you, um, well, you train it, okay, but how do you make it better? Do you just uh, take more layers or? Uh... How do you make it better? Well, that's kind of the, the art form, right? So that there's not really, that's a problem in machine learning. There is no guidebook that you can follow step by step, how do I make my network better? It's a little bit of a dark art, you know? It's like a lot of tricks and a lot of intuitive things you have to know by experience, so it's not that easy. But um, like if you start reading about machine learning, and there's a lot of really good open like online courses that you can follow that give you a lot of insights into the different things you can do, but yeah. Yeah, but so you, you can use one network to classify, classify uh, different image sets Sure. It really doesn't de uh, depend on what you put into it. It just depends on the training data. Yeah, that, that's the really nice thing about machine learning is you have this one paradigm, neural networks plus backpropagation, and it turns out you can solve these two things together. You can, you can solve a lot of different problems. So it doesn't matter if you're doing image classification or translation or you know, speech to text. All of these things can be solved with the same underlying technique, and that's the surprising thing. That's why I think this is very different from the previous state of software, because we have this one algorithm, and it turns out if, if you put different data in it, you get a different program. That, mm -hmm. That's a really nice thing about it. Mm -hmm. okay. Behind you. Let's make it probably the last question. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, maybe no building on top of that. Uh, so, if you are in a business and you are you have some resources assigned, some machine learning engineers, and you have some resources who are collecting data. Yeah. As far as I understand, if you have a better quality, better pre-processed data, you can get better results. Sure. Absolutely. And you can develop better model architectures or more deeper layers, yeah. and you can still get a better result. Yeah. So, as a as a PhD student or as an engineer, where do you draw the line? Where do you put more resources to improve the data? I would to definitely the, say getting clean data better. is more important than getting good models. So if your data is messy or unclean, you can try whatever you want, it will not work. But if your data is clean, even with a very shitty, shallow network, you can usually get a lot of good performance. So I would say spend a lot of time on data cleaning. But maybe not just about the quality, also about the amount of data. Maybe you okay. could spend more money to get more data. Sure. And you could spend more money sure. on resources to improve your... Well, there, there's definitely a trade-off there, right? Like, there is diminishing returns. If you keep getting more and more data, eventually it won't give you that much. So that's really task-dependent. But, but I would say, in terms of getting more data, try also to think about, instead of getting more data, maybe I can reuse a model that's trained on a similar task, like the example I showed you with the pet bottles. Instead of getting more images of pet bottles, we just took a pre-trained network and we used the limited amount of data we have with the pre-trained model. You also have a good solution. So that's, that's a bit of, yeah, that's something you need like, to try and experience. So there's, not really a, there's no guidebook for it, cool. unfortunately. Thanks. <laughs> All right. 
the very, very last question. <laughs> I don't see you. So far? Uh, yes. Hi, thanks. Uh, so far we were talking about uh, creating autonomous robots. What yeah. about a mixture between humans and robots? How long do we need until we see some specimen working? Well, I know there's a lot of research going on in prosthetic limbs, for example. So I did my uh, master thesis in brain-computer interfaces. So you put an EEG headset on someone's head, it can sort of learn how to interpret what you're thinking. Not exactly what you're thinking, because the thing on top of your head is your motor cortex. So it's the thing that steers your muscles. And so what people are doing right now, imagine you lose your arm in an accident. You can have prosthetic arms that if you think about doing this with your real arm, the prosthetic arm is controlled by a machine learning algorithm that looks at your brain signals, it recognizes, oh, you want to close your fist, and the prosthetic arm does it for you. So there is a lot of work going on in that area, for example, making prosthetic limbs so that if you have a car accident, you can learn how to walk again, not with biological legs, but with you know, robotic legs. Um, and I think it's going to start happening more and more. So, you know, if you think about something like a cochlear implant for people that have a hearing impairment, this is kind of a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a biological system that is combined with, with, with hardware which is silicon-based. So, I think we're already seeing the start of this, but obviously, you know, it's going to start increasing. But on the other hand, I think we also have to agree that the, the biological body we live in is a very sophisticated system, and it's not that easy to just swap out parts. So I think it's going to take a while before you can completely, you know, swap out all your biological systems. But you know, piece by piece, we're going to have a lot more tools. I think. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Andrew. That was a very, very cool talk, and I hope you all agree. So you know, join me in thanking for this wonderful presentation. You're welcome. And in the end, a couple of more thank yous. First of all, thanks to the great team at Envision for hosting us here tonight. If you want to learn more about the upcoming events, you know, check out the board or events.envision.de. And thank you all. It would not be possible without you. And we hope to see you all next time. Have a good evening. All right.